Welcome to Behavioral Groups. My name is Kurt Nelson. I'm here with my co-host, Tim Houlihan, and we interview interesting people to understand and gain insight into why we do what we do, and then we explore how we can apply those insights to work and life. So, Kurt, i got a question for you. Okay. As a customer, have you ever had an experience that was just way more difficult than you thought it was going to be? Yeah, and this is not necessarily a customer perspective, but I have just hired a new employee. Okay. She still lives in Michigan, and I need to get a Michigan tax ID so I can pay the unemployment insurance for Michigan. And I have done this with other employees. I had one in Colorado who I've done this for, and it was relatively smooth. Granted, it was working through a government component. Yeah. But as for that concern, Colorado was pretty, pretty good. Well, I'm assuming you just go on the web, find the form, fill it out. That's what I assumed as well. However, I went on the site, looked around, could not find where to register my company as uh, having an employee in Michigan and how to do that as an out-of-state. There was nowhere to, to find that. Once I did go through probably five pages of different things to get to that spot where I did, it then led me to I think 12 pages of filling out things from everything from, you know, how many locations do you have in Michigan where I'm like going, I don't have any, and a a number of other things where they already asked me, are you just employing an employee or are you doing business in Michigan? And so having already answered those questions and then having to re-answer them was very difficult. And it would keep going back. You'd get to the very end and then it wouldn't process until because I had missed something back on, on page three. And then on top of all of this, I just received in the mail this week a letter. A letter. A letter from, from the, the U- uni- through the U.S. Postal Service. You, the U.S. Postal Service that said, hey, this is the you know, Michigan Unemployment Tax Office. You saw that you applied. By the way, you left one piece blank on this. And so you have to go back in and fill out how many places of operation are you going to have in Michigan, but which I swear already, I already had filled in. You, why wouldn't it tell, would have told you that when you were on the web? And why wouldn't it just send me an email on that? They have my email as well, but no, they send me a, a letter. So it created a lot. It's creating, not created. It is creating a lot of friction for me to get uh, my new employee set up so I can pay taxes for them. In Michigan. That sounds like a lot of friction. It is. Well, that's just what our episode is about today. It's how friction in the customer experience impacts loyalty and revenues. We also talked about how corporate leaders could help employees be more engaged by reducing nonsensical friction in their daily work lives, like useless paperwork or the doubling of forms and data between separate systems. And there's a great insight on, you know, Receipts and uh, on on, uh, expense reports. Expense reports. Absolutely. All right. So Roger Dooley is the author of Friction, a book summarizing tons of great examples of when companies do good things to reduce friction for customers and some not so good things to increase friction. Roger is also the author of Brainfluence, 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. He is also the founder of Dooley Direct, a marketing consultancy and frequent speaker on topics of marketing and neuroscience. Roger even has ties to Carnegie Mellon as he earned his engineering degree there and then went on to complete his MBA from the University of Tennessee. Kind of cool he's got a CMU connection there. There you go. That's pretty fun. So plug in, get focused, and reduce the friction in your environment while you listen to our discussion with Roger Dooley. Let's, let's go ahead and get started with the speed round. Bicycle or unicycle? Bicycle. I would fall off a unicycle in 0.3 seconds. <laughs> life without a laptop or life without a mobile phone? You know, uh, I am of a generation where probably the laptop, uh, uh, I still get more value out of. I do all my writing on a laptop and so on, although they will be difficult to do without. Yeah. Up the mountain or down the mountain? Up. 
up is uh, easier in certain ways. Uh, have you ever tried going down a steep mountain? It's kind of uh, scary. Yeah. I was wondering if you're going to go for a friction s- story on that, but no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we need more or less friction in our lives? Uh, generally less, uh, less friction is almost always good, but sometimes adding friction can help us do things like break bad habits or steer the behavior of others. All right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Because you have a a new book coming out, Friction. And so can you just tell us, kind of give us an overview of, of what this book is about and what was the impetus? What, what got you thinking about writing this book? Well, I'll try and give you as condensed an answer to that as possible. But uh, uh, for the last 15 years or so, I've been writing about uh, the topic of neuromarketing, uh, which sort of morphed into uh, a broader area of behavioral science in marketing and business. Uh, And a few years ago, I came up with a little framework called the persuasion slide, uh, loosely based on B.J. Fogg's behavior model, but uh, uh, designed to help marketers incorporate both conscious and non-conscious aspects to their marketing. Uh, Four simple elements to it, which we're not going to go through, but one of those elements is friction. That's what uh, happens when the child gets halfway down the slide and gets stuck because it was rusty or poorly maintained. Uh, And I realized that of the various elements, uh, that was perhaps the most interesting because uh, Uh, If you were trying to get somebody to uh, either change a behavior or do a behavior, uh, often uh, reducing friction is the easiest way to accomplish that and the cheapest way to accomplish that instead of trying to increase their motivation and reduce friction. So uh, I started thinking about that. And uh, uh, first, from a standpoint uh, primarily of customer experience, uh, uh, explaining why trillions of dollars uh, every year are left in e-commerce shopping carts uh, uh, and because checkout processes were too complicated or people had to set up accounts and such. Uh, but then it sort of morphed into well, the uh, internal friction in business organizations, uh, all the wasted time, the stupid rules, the uh, meaningless meetings and um, you know messing with email for hours. Uh, and uh, then finally, at the macro level, uh, how friction even determines the fate of nations, uh, uh, mm. uh, India versus China, where uh, there's a lot of reasons why today uh, in China's economy is eight times the size of India's when 30 years ago they were the same. There are different cultures, different uh, uh, business environments, different government systems, and so on. But – uh, a big one is that uh, India was an incredibly difficult place to do business. It still is pretty difficult, but it's it's improved in recent years. But uh, it was just so difficult that Indian entrepreneurs often had to make a choice. Uh, do they go into the underground economy where uh, they wouldn't have to deal with all the licenses and regulations, but would have difficulty in scaling beyond uh, a modest size? Or do they go to another country and start a business? And many uh, chose the latter. So, uh, and then finally, personal behavior too is governed by friction. If you want to develop habits uh, or break bad habits, you can manipulate the friction involved in those. So, uh, really, what I came up with uh, was a concept, kind of a strange concept for a book, perhaps. Uh, it's not one of those uh, really tightly focused uh, books on customer experience, but uh, that sort of tries to unify the effects of friction across all these different domains. Wow. Love it. Love it. Can you define you, how you're using the term friction for our listeners. How, how, what is friction to you in the way that you use it in, in this context? Right. And uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I define it as uh, uh, the unnecessary expenditure of effort and also proxies for effort, which can be time and money. So uh, the... Uh, There's a huge body of literature, uh, actually going back centuries, about how humans uh, are basically lazy and will avoid effort. Uh, Going all the way back to William of Ockham in the 13th century, I think. uh, uh, Wow. Yeah, this this really goes way back, before my time anyway. Um, (laughs) uh, Not before Tim's, though. No, 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 okay. Uh, He talked about the law of least effort. uh, And then fast forwarding to Daniel Kahneman, who may be uh, a little bit more familiar uh, to our listeners. Uh, He, too, talks about our brains and a law of least effort and how uh, we will almost always choose the lower effort path if one is available. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, um, uh, Richard Thaler, another Nobel Prize winner along with Kahneman, uh, 
talks about how making things easy uh, is the way to get people to do stuff. And uh, he actually provided a nice uh, blurb for the book and uh, points out in that that he's often asked by governments, how can we get people to do these things, you know, com- um, pay their taxes, comply with our laws, uh, you know, do something that the government wants them to do. And inevitably, uh, he says, make it easier. But often, uh, that perhaps is too simplistic a solution because they don't do it. And uh, so <laughs> right. uh, it's um, uh, that's really the origin of it. And I guess the one type of friction that I would uh, disavow is that sort of interpersonal friction, which I uh, mentioned in the very intro to the book that uh, – you know, when people think about friction in business, often it's the toxic boss or the obnoxious coworker or something like that that's always getting into arguments with you. Uh, that is not the kind of friction I'm talking about. It's not interpersonal friction. Not interpersonal friction. It's the unnecessary expenditure of effort component that we're going for here. Yeah. Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah. No. So, so we were talking a little bit about uh, the fact that governments, even though they've been informed by some of the best brains in the world – uh, they still aren't doing that. And there's probably some friction involved with them not doing it. So. Well, you know, I think that um, governments in general uh, don't always behave in the most rational, uh, logical fashion. Uh, re- <laughs> yeah. you know, they d- do not always um, – act in a way that, say, the evidence uh, might suggest is the best way to do it. And so that's, it's not a great surprise because you have competing interests. Um, and, you know, there is – some governments are actually working toward this. Uh, um, many governments now have installed nudge units, uh, yep. which uh, are – Units that use behavioral science to try and accomplish important objectives like uh, getting people to save for retirement or uh, perhaps uh, uh, comply with tax laws and so on. And, and this is, uh, you know, I think a, a real sign of progress. These nudge units generally don't have uh, the ability to boss, uh, be the boss of everything and tell people what to do, but uh, they can recommend actions and often these actions are implemented. Uh, even in the United States, uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, some of that going on. I know that uh, uh, my uh, friend Matt Cutts, uh, who used to be uh, at Google, uh, uh, is now working for the government in, as a technology leader. And a lot of their effort has been uh, simplifying processes, just trying to take uh, the friction out of uh, sort of onerous processes. Like if you ever had to deal with um, – you know, form for something. You know, yes. Often the, the form is ridiculously long. Uh, even the uh, way you have to complete it is kind of arcane. Uh, perhaps you're editing a PDF or something. You know, it's it's uh, so to try and make these things uh, just simpler and faster, so that instead of being a two hour process, it's a ten minute process. And when you do that, uh, big surprise, uh, more people do it the way they're supposed to. Yeah. We interviewed um, Michael Hallsworth, who actually was on the Brit- the, the the nudge unit in British, the um, behavioral insights team over there, and, and talked a lot about that. And actually, you know, one of the acronyms that they developed was EAST, you know, which stands for easy, the very first letter, right? E for easy, yeah. social. Attractive. Attractive. Timely. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Attractive, social, timely. I <laughs> right. And, and starting with easy. Or whatever. But it, it's very true when you think about the governments are, are trying to do it. I think they're just sometimes such a behemoth that, you know, you're trying to move this, you know, big ship and you only have a, a little bit. But, you know, hopefully over time we can we can move, keep moving with them. So. Well, I think so. And I'm uh, I'm hoping that uh, maybe one or two uh, uh, government leaders might read my book and uh, get inspired to uh, try and eliminate some of the friction involved in the processes. Although the problem is there's so many constituencies like the uh, U.S. taxes, for example, uh, there's something like 107 pages in the instructions for the um, Form 1040, the basic return that individuals have to fill out uh, uh, to pay their taxes every year. Uh, That's just the instructions for that. I mean, who can even read that? That's why uh, 90 percent of all taxpayers in the U.S. either uh, go to uh, someplace where they get professional assistance, in other words, a professional preparer, or uh, they use tax software. And if you look at the difference, uh, the way uh, tax software treats you versus the government forms, uh, the government expects you to read these instructions and simply fill in little blanks. Instead, uh, businesses like TurboTax create an interface that's very simple, very friendly, asks you one or two questions on a screen. Uh, they explain what uh, they want or why they want it, uh, and 
I'll help you get it if necessary. And then you go on to the next screen and it's all very encouraging. You can see your progress, you know, all very uh, uh, smart from a behavioral science standpoint. Yeah. And I saw recently there's been, uh, I think there's a lawsuit going on because of the fact that the the free filing because m- many of these people are going through these these services um, and they're being charged for it because of the service that they're using and yet they're talking about it's a free filing so again to the to the fact that if the government was able to change their website to to do what the TurboTax does, uh, you're you're eliminating the need for for that whole industry to, to be out there. Right. So. I know it's and I know you'll find this totally shocking, but apparently the tax preparation industry is uh, lobbying heavily against the government <laughs> making it easier. Gee, that's a big shock. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, uh, in, in, in reading your book, Roger, I was thinking of, um, for some reason, it reminded me of the post-war period when uh, uh, the United States and Europe were in big manufacturing uh, worlds and manufacturing was an important part of the economy. And so efficiency in, in, in manufacturing was a big deal. And I feel like you're coming to this this story of friction as as a guide to marketers to be the efficiency expert, you know, to come in and say, you can trim, you can make things more efficient and better for your customer experience, for your internal uh, meetings, for all, you know, this whole wide variety of things um, by making things you know, by uh, decreasing friction. And and it's like an efficiency story to me. I think it's really cool. And I think that marketers need it today. Right. Well, you know, it's uh, efficiency is a part of it. Uh, uh, you know, I think, well, you know, one thing that's really surprising is that uh, people usually think that what's important is delighting your customers and exceeding their expectations if you want loyal customers. And Gartner Group has some data showing that it's uh, not that, uh, but uh, rather the effort involved. And I'll give you an example of delighting a customer that people always hold up as a great example. Um, when a family left a resort, I think it was Four Seasons, and uh, their child left a little stuffed animal behind, rather than just shipping the stuffed animal back to the family, uh, they created this whole little photo album of uh, him enjoying the resort, hanging out with other stuffed animals by the pool and going for rides and so on. Uh, and sent back this whole package, uh, which then went viral on social media. Uh, and, you know, that's great. It's a wonderful uh, experience, but it is very difficult to scale, particularly if you don't have the resources of a high-end resort. Uh, and even then, you simply can't do that for all of your customers all of the time. Right uh, Now, what, what Gartner data shows is that... Uh, Customer effort, particularly in dealing with customer service, like one step beyond the simple order placement, uh, is what really drives loyalty. Uh, Their data shows that uh, 9% of customers who had low effort experiences reported being disloyal compared to 96% of customers who had a high effort experience. So that's a 10x difference uh, right there. Uh, And it's all based on customer effort. And what that high effort experience might be, uh, which we've all experienced, is, uh, say, having to switch channels when you're resolving a problem. So uh, you start off on Twitter and they say, oh, well, call our 800 number. Or you call their 800 number and you explain your problem to first person and they say, oh, uh, yeah, let me transfer it to the person who can really resolve your problem. And you have to go through the whole thing again. And, you know, uh, this is really the key to loyalty is just making everything as smooth as possible. You know, on uh, my loyalty to Amazon was tested. Amazon is one of the few brands I'm pretty loyal to. Uh, and uh, it was tested a few years ago. Uh, Amazon in the state of Texas, where I live, uh, reached an agreement that they would char- start charging sales tax, which previously they had not, which okay. meant uh, for me as their customer, an immediate 8% price increase across wow. the board and everything I bought from Amazon. And I expected that because of that, I would shop around more. In fact, I said, gee, I'm going to have to shop around more now. Uh, in fact, uh, it was so effortless to keep shopping with Amazon that uh, I kept doing it. I rarely shopped around and even more wow. rarely actually bought from somebody else. And this, uh, I attribute to the fact that uh, they make it so 
easy. They always keep you logged in. Uh, that little one-click button is always there. It's armed and ready for action. Uh, and it makes it so easy. You know that you, when you click that button uh, within 48 hours or less in some places, uh, that product will be on your doorstep. Yeah, uh, and, that's amazing. And you know, compare that to just about anybody else's customer experience. And now, uh, before they even had serious competition uh, with that, uh, they're upping their game and rolling out one-day delivery for their Prime customers. Right. So, you know, they are they are setting the bar and they're moving the bar upwards, um, which is what really businesses uh, need to think about. You don't just say, well, gee, you know, we are a uh, business in XYZ industry, so what are our competitors doing? And say, well, hey, we're better than uh, they are. Uh, people are comparing your customer experience uh, to Amazon to Uber, uh, even if you're not in uh, online shopping or transportation, uh, you know, this is what they're used to. Uh, my uh, cable provider, my cable internet provider, uh, uh, only keeps six months worth of uh, invoices online. So if I want to go back and check a bill from a little bit earlier, as I might do, say, when I'm doing my taxes at the end of the year, yep. it's not there. Uh, Amazon, I can go back 12 years or more on uh, my orders, and yeah, everything's there. It's just easy. Uh, you know, yeah. why? In, so even though Amazon does not compete with um, my cable provider, uh, I am wondering, well, if Amazon can do this, you know, why can't these guys? It's not like, uh, you know, cloud storage is all that expensive. Uh, it's just, you know, some IT person somewhere made a decision that, uh, well, then people would never need more than six months, so uh, we won't bother showing it to them. So, Roger, have you yeah. seen with the – you talk about Amazon and Uber and a variety of these these components that are really raising that bar – and yet, there, as you said, your cable company isn't necessarily meeting it. Are you seeing though companies rising to that occasion more than in the past, or is it, is it still, you know, doing business as usual in many of these places? And, and have you seen a difference? And why do you think that difference is, if there is? You know, I think that some companies are, but I think it's still limited. Uh, you know, businesses often simply do not look at what their customers are doing. Uh, they don't actually observe them as they're interacting with their website or their mobile app or their retail environment, whatever they might happen to have. Uh, they just assume they know what the customers want. Uh, and, you know, it's really ironic how many companies say that they are customer centric uh, in their mission statement or the customer is uh, the most important part of our business or make all these wonderful statements. But when push comes to shove and it means, uh, gee, do we invest this money in improving the experience or do we make this quarter's numbers, uh, this quarter's numbers usually win out. Uh, and I've talked to customer service experts, people or customer experience experts who just, you know, spend 100 percent of their time in this space. And, you know, they see modest improvements, but uh, by and large, uh, companies still have a much uh higher perception of the experience they're delivering uh, versus what their how their customers would rate that experience and i i, I really believe it's because uh, you know the simplest things we're you know we talk about um, uh, human behavior here uh, you know what's the first thing you do you actually observe human behavior and that means observing your customers while they're trying to do stuff yeah well i mean even best practices i am still amazed because amazon has had the one click component for how many years now i mean it has been a very long time, uh, and and there's research that shows how effective that is, and all of the component. And I think you even bring up in your book about the the trillions that are lost because people get yeah. to that checkout process and then don't, you know, continue through. And yet, I don't see one press or one button, one click checkouts in very many other, you know, electronic or e, e businesses, even. You know, I fly a lot and wow, it would be great if I could just go to Delta and just click because they have all my information, but they don't do that. And it's a convoluted process on, well, on that. Well, so. you're, you're a Delta person, apparently. I'm a United person and uh, their user experience is the worst. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I can pick out about 10 examples. In fact, often in my speeches, I uh, pick on them just because it's so easy it to is. come up with uh, examples of uh, how they could um, take the friction out of their customer experience. One thing they do is uh, log you out after 20 minutes. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, when was the last time Amazon logged you out? Never, right? Uh, when you Never. got a new computer, maybe. Uh, and <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but uh, United, they don't do that. Now, Amazon, you would, th you would say, well, gee, maybe Amazon security is just weak. You know, they figure that, 
you know, they'll take uh, fraud losses versus uh, uh, ruining their customer experience. But actually, uh, they do things in a more sophisticated, nuanced way. Uh, if uh, they don't log you out and they keep that one-click button there for you, but if you say, well, I'm going to ship this TV to a uh, different address that I've never shipped to before, uh, they're going to reauthenticate you somehow. If you decide to send gift cards to a bunch of people uh, that are pretty much a cash equivalent, uh, yeah. they will reauthenticate you because those are higher-risk transactions. And But uh, unfortunately, most businesses, like airlines, uh, have sort of a one-size-fits-all. You know, you're logged in, you're logged out. Uh, if you're logged in, you can see your stuff, you can make reservations or do whatever you need to. Uh, but if, if you're logged out, you can't do anything. Where, uh, you know, a more logical approach might be to say, okay, well, look, um, we're going to keep you logged in for most things. Uh, we're going to let you uh, view your uh, current flights. You're going to be able to check status, maybe change a seat, uh, you know, do things like that. Maybe even uh, purchase tickets for your own use. But if you decide to transfer, uh, you know, 200,000 miles to another account uh, from your mileage plan, yeah. okay, uh, we're going to maybe reauthenticate you because that seems like a kind of potentially risky transaction. Uh, yeah. But, you know, they, this doesn't happen. Uh, and unfortunately, more people are doing it. Uh, uh, Marriott got hacked, and now they've got apparently a new aggressive security approach. So, you know, when you're trying to make reservations, you know, you're bouncing back and forth between flights and hotels and rental cars and whatnot. Uh, you know, I'm just constantly finding uh, getting logged out um, on the site that I wasn't looking at, and it drives me crazy. Well, you know, with all this, uh, I love picking on the airlines, and and I, we have talked about this in the past that you are in, an incredibly loyal and dedicated United flyer. But it's not because you love the airline; it's because it's it's about the only damn option that you got. And, and we're, you know, uh, Kurt and I happen to be here in Minneapolis, which is a Delta hub, and seventy seven percent of the flights are are Delta. So we are incredibly loyal to Delta, but not because we love it. And and given all the opportunities that they have. What what keeps a, a United or a Delta or American or any of these uh, British Airways? Oh my God! You know, changing the you know British Airways to, you know change tea providers and now you know they're charging for tea. It's just crazy. Why why are they doing this? Do you think? Well, uh, you know, it's it's kind of strange. I think uh, they are one of the few industries that diminishes the base product. Uh, you know, in other words, you know, Apple doesn't make the worst iPhone even worse. Uh, they introduce new and better models at the top end and make the older ones cheaper. Right. Uh, but uh, the airlines uh, uh, actually employ what some people call product sabotage, where they make the cheaper experience worse. You know, you can't take a bag. You can't pick a seat. Uh, uh, you know, you've got to crawl into the overhead bin if you want to fly this at this fair. Uh, you know, it's uh, – and they – do that because it pushes people into either buying add-ons or you know, using a higher price fare. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate because uh, it gives people a really, I think, a negative feeling about the airline. And the way they keep people loyal is with uh, their rewards programs. Because in Austin, I can actually have uh, no clear choice of uh, airlines. Uh, American, Delta, Southwest, and United all fly out of here. Uh, Southwest probably has more flights than anybody. But – uh, once you are elite on an airline, I happen to be on United, but I have some of my friends who are elite on Delta. You pretty much have to stick with that airline to maintain your status and to right. uh, and, and just to get treated well. Like if I, uh, you know, if, if I fly United out of here, uh, there's a good chance that even if I pay for a coach ticket, maybe I'll get a an upgrade to the front cabin. Uh, yeah. If nothing else, I can get a, a, one of the best uh, coach seats. Uh, if I fly American. Uh, I'm going to be in the last row in the middle, uh, you know, that I can't recline because uh, that's where my status will get me, uh, you know, unless I want to pay for a, a big upgrade. So that's how they keep you loyal. But unfortunately, uh, unlike my Amazon loyalty, that was true loyalty when even it was tested, uh, you know, I stuck with them. Uh, you know, if American came to me and said, OK, uh, you know, uh, we're going to do everything that United does for you and we're going to even throw in a little sweetener here. Uh, you know, I would certainly be tempted to switch. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's a, more of a transactional loyalty than an emotional loyalty. Well, and it, it feels like the airlines are really only per paying attention to the top flyers. That like their loyalty focus is on on big time flyers, whereas Amazon says anybody can get in. I mean, basically with with paying for Prime, you can get into the elite club. Right. Yeah. It, well, that's the way they've done it. Uh, um, I think when people have asked about uh, that, uh, they've said that it's not uh, 
because uh, to me, this tarnishes the brand for all of them. You know, when, when a brand right. uh, makes the experience worse for any class, uh, then it tarnishes a brand. But uh, the airlines feel that it is not practical to uh, have, say, a decent uh, airline where even the, the worst seats are pretty good uh, and right. everybody's treated reasonably well uh, and then a budget airline. So the big brands, uh, the Uniteds and Americans and Deltas feel they have to compete with the budget airlines. So uh, they just diminish the uh, quality of the service for the bargain fares. So Roger, you talked about the, you know, th- some of that friction of changing is around the awards program, right? And the, the element that, hey, I am I am an elite status on on whichever airline it is. Uh, have have you heard of or or thought about, I mean, if a United or say say you're in a United person, but say Delta came to you and said, look, we know that you are an elite status on United. If you transfer over to Delta, we will give you a hundred thousand miles to begin with. And you're, you know, that are flight miles. And so you're already in your gold status or whatever it would be. Would that help in, in allowing maybe some of that switching to happen a, a little bit easier? And have you heard of anything like that? Right. Well, if the CEO of Delta is listening, then uh, yes, I would be amenable to that. But uh, no, seriously, <laughs> uh, actually, they uh, you don't even have to get uh, the CEO to intervene. Um, I have not attempted this, but I have been told that uh, if you do have a high-level status on any of the major airlines, the other airlines will uh, grant you a provisional match. Uh, in other words, they will let you uh, have their same uh, elite status uh, for the first year, for some period of time, but then you'll have to meet the, uh, whatever the mileage objectives are and so on, and dollar objectives to maintain yeah. that status. So they do try and make it easier uh, to switch, but uh, I, not having attempted that myself, I can't tell you how easy or difficult it is, but, you know, it, it's, um, it would certainly be somewhat difficult because you know, you've, then you've got to go through all these calculations of, well, gee, there's only nine months left in the year and how many miles. And so, yeah, it's, it yeah. is a high friction experience. And once you're locked in, it is difficult to get unlocked. So uh, I, I wanted to switch back to, uh, we've been talking about reducing friction is so important, but there are places where increasing friction can be beneficial, right? I mean, you, you, you talk about, uh, you know, tax policies, you know, uh, taxes on things like tobacco and gasoline or, you know, luxury taxes from time to time, um, you know, can, uh, can inhibit uh, behaviors, right? Um, what, what, do, you, do you think that marketers should be looking or, or are there places where marketers should be looking to increase friction? Oh. Well, generally, uh, there aren't too many of those for marketers because usually you're trying to get customers to take action. And uh, if you have an if there's an action you don't want them to take, then, uh, you know, maybe you can eliminate that. Uh, but, uh, yes, um, um, my uh, friend Brian Massey here runs a, a business called Conversion Science in Austin. Uh, I had a, an interesting example of a website. Uh, they were helping to optimize the uh, owner of that website wanted more phone leads. It, there was a phone number, a toll-free number on the website, and a form on the website. And so that uh, depending on how a customer wanted to communicate with the company, they could choose either one. Uh, what the company found was that the phone leads were much more productive. They were much more likely to convert into uh, a sale than the web leads or the web form leads. So they said, okay, we want more phone leads. Uh, the first uh, test that they ran uh, took the web form off the site so that basically people would have only the toll-free number to call. What they found was that, uh, oddly enough, the uh, number of phone leads went down. In other words, instead of getting all the original phone leads plus some percentage of the ones that would have been web form leads, uh, the total number went down, uh, wow. which was kind of perplexing. So uh, they tried another experiment. Uh, in this case, they paired the 800 number with uh, a form that was really long, lots of fields, like one of these horrendous forms that you take one look at and you cringe, say, I'm not going to fill in all that stuff. Uh, and uh, the headline said something like, uh, look, uh, we can help you immediately if you call in, but if you really prefer to uh, communicate uh, by email, then just fill out this form and we will get back with you. What they found was that nobody filled out the horribly long form, but the contrast in friction, apparently, and this you've got to sort of impute this. They didn't uh, have 
necessarily actual science behind the why of it, but the number of phone leads increased uh, to the highest level of all the various uh, things they had tested. So providing this uh, really high friction form uh, drove more leads to the channel that they wanted. So that's that's one example. Uh, and in general, uh, uh, adding a little bit of friction can reduce uh, things that you want to, but hopefully in a uh, a good and ethical way. You know, uh, back right. in the days when there were record clubs, uh, uh, they shipped you your re- uh, record of the month or your CD in a package that you basically destroyed to get into. Uh, even though you were entitled to return that, uh, since you destroyed the package, returning it was a high friction experience. You would have to find a box that you could put that thing in, wrap it up and tape it up and everything. Uh, and as a result, people tended to just keep the thing, even if they didn't wasn't their favorite. They say, "Oh heck, it's been too much trouble." Yeah, it's right. not that bad. Uh, and that is the wrong way to do it. You know, you don't try and make uh, uh, returns deliberately difficult uh, for your customers. Uh, but um, an example of where it could be used, say, in a more ethical way, is um, a company that found that its employees were uh, accessing the retirement plan. Uh, to uh, their funds that were in the retirement plan uh, for simple things like, you know, they had to uh, pay a bill this month or something, and they were able to do that just by phone. Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't want to make it overly difficult, but this, they felt, was not really in the employee's best interest to be tapping these funds for retirement every time they needed uh, some quick cash. Right. Uh, so they uh, instead went with a form, uh, not a difficult form, but just, okay, you want this, just uh, you know, drop by, fill out this form, and we'll get it taken care of. And people who needed it uh, for something important uh, uh, would do that, but they found they were able to reduce uh, the number of uh, redemptions that way. And you know, so there, that isn't really a dark pattern, as some people might call it, which would be sort of an unethical use of behavioral science, but uh, just really something that was accomplishing an objective in the same way that you get people to sign up for a retirement plan by making it the default option instead of making people fill out a form to enroll. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, a great example. Yeah, I think uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, you know, they've been talking a lot about nudging, right? But then they also have been recently talking about sludge, those those uh, Im- elements that are pretty much unethical, to your point, in the the – you know, record of the month club is an ex- perfect example of that, where you're you're doing something that isn't necessarily in the best interest of of your customer or your employees, and you're you're doing it because it has some financial or other gain for you, but doesn't necessarily make that element a good across everybody. So yeah, well, I, I can give you a great example uh, that uh, an experience that I just had with a, a company that I have a lot of respect for. Um, uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, they have a wine club, and I enjoy the occasional glass of wine. So um, I signed up for this, and they ship you a, a whole pile of wines, like uh, I don't know, a dozen bottles or 15 bottles or something, at a very uh, reasonable price. Uh, and they do that with the understanding that you will have the option every three months or something of taking another shipment at not quite so discounted a price as your first shipment. And that's the sort of one to get <laughs> yeah. you. You know, I mean, that, that's how many of these clubs work. They get you yep. in with a discount. And then, uh, and so I said, okay, well, I, I understood that. So I put a little note in my calendar of, uh, you know, a week or two before. So I should reevaluate to whether I wanted to continue getting that product at the full price. And so uh, I jump on their website when my calendar item fired off, and uh, there was uh, found immediately where I needed to go. Uh, and there were two options. Uh, if I wanted to uh, oh, ship immediately, I could do that. I could uh, turn on auto renew if it wasn't on, uh, but there was no option to turn off auto renew. <laughs> so I, as I was, I'm looking, there's like this, wow. you know, and I expected auto renew to be on. I did not expect there to be like no toggle switch where I could, you know, uh, click something like you would in, in most situations. So I'm, I uh, read, uh, they open up this little pop-up box and there's a bunch of text in there that says, basically, uh, you should call customer service if you want to turn off auto renew. Now, they don't provide a phone number for customer service. They just say, call customer service. <laughs> wow. So, okay, so I uh, hunt around. I find a number for customer service. And I talk to, uh, well, first I go through a phone tree, a menu of one of these things. You know, if you want to do this, press one. Okay, fine. Uh, get get to a human uh, and explain what I want uh, and say, oh, you want to turn off or renew. Well, okay, uh, I can get you to the person who can do that for you and no. dumps, me, dumps me into another phone queue where eventually I do get to a human who, after uh, several attempts to 
uh, dissuade me from taking that action, finally turn it off. Now, you know, to me, I, this this wasn't horrible, and uh, I got good value out of the first shipment, and, you know, I probably uh, wouldn't have minded even if I had gotten another one, but uh, this, to me, is a really sort of exploiting uh, friction, where uh, my guess is that at least some people who are on the fence about the subscription are at some point during that process are going to give up and say, gee, I don't have time to do this. Uh, yeah, the wine is pretty good. I'll, I'll take another shipment and then see what happens. Uh, just because it was such a d- complicated, difficult process to turn off auto renew. Uh, so, you know, I, that's... I don't, I don't know if that would qualify as a sludge or not, but to me, it's um, it's kind of pushing the limit of yeah. what I would expect, uh, you know, a good company to do for their customers. You know, Amazon would not do that to you, I don't think. Uh, they right. make it easy to return stuff. Uh, right. uh, in fact, incredibly easy. Well, and, and to that degree, it, it lends itself into now this long-term component where I've had similar experiences where you you sign up for that three the the – the low cost three month trial, and then you try to get out of it. So I don't do that anymore because I know that at the end of that three month, if I don't want it to try to get out of it is going to be this, you know, Herculean effort trying to get through a <laughs> labyrinth of, of different prompts and different things. And people, again, you know, that component of they got to get you to say no three times before they they stop. And so you, you actually I think it dissuades people from even doing that initial component, which companies are so trying to get people to do right. They're trying to get them to to try the product so that they they like it and realize they like it and, and then, you know, continue on. But you're you're inhibiting people from even trying because you're anticipating the 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 hardship at the end. Well, or as Roger says, the unnecessary expenditure of effort. Right. You know, and and with the, your Wall Street Journal example, you went above and beyond to get something done that seemed like it could have been. It certainly could have been made easier. Oh yeah, I mean, if they uh, logically the little thing that says turn auto renew on could have been a toggle switch that would show it as being on. I could click that and turn it off and turn it uh, off. But uh, uh, I'm sure they found that they lost some sales <laughs> if they made it that easy uh, or if they even tested that. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, there's there's so many examples of that. Uh, uh, cable providers, satellite uh, radio providers, uh, they all use this um, approach of getting you uh, in using a discounted price, uh, then automatically raise the price at some point and force you to go back and renegotiate uh, uh, you know, I went through this with um, my satellite radio provider that I used in uh, my truck, and uh, they uh, – every year I would have to uh, get the cheaper price. So they would be about $200, and to get the $99 a year price, I would have to call in and negotiate and threaten to cancel, and they would say, yeah. okay, uh, we'll, we'll give you the $99 deal. And so, okay, fine. I'll do it for another year. And then finally I decided, yeah, that's – even that is probably more value that I'm getting out of this. You know, I've got other sources now. I've got uh, uh, podcasts and such. So um, I tell them, no, okay, I don't want the $99 deal. They came back with $30 for six months. Oh, my gosh. And and the first time I did that, I was like, whoa, that's that's really not a bad price. So, you know, I do listen to uh, <laughs> Bloomberg and CNBC and stuff. So, okay, I'll do it. Uh, but then I realized um, after one period of doing that, that uh, now my renegotiation threshold was every six months. So every six months, I would have to go in, deal with, uh, you know, an offshore call center and uh, uh, play let's make a deal with people until they gave me the best price. And so I finally just pulled the pin on and said, uh, it's okay, uh, forget it. Uh, we're, we're not going to do it. And uh, even now, I'm, I'm getting regular emails offering me that $30 price. But, uh, you know, it, and it's too bad because I was a loyal customer for years. And instead of saying, gee, Roger's a loyal customer. Uh, we're going to do something nice for him. Instead, uh, they say, we, we can squeeze some more money out of Roger if, uh, if he's not paying close attention. And, uh, and, you know, it's really self-defeating. And, you know, this is one reason why uh, cable companies, cable TV companies, uh, uh, internet providers uh, have such a horrible reputation for customer service uh, because they uh, are, this is the way they think. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really a uh, key piece of this and thinking about as an organization, how do we treat our customer? The same thing you said 
earlier about the airlines and, and the component of adding on, you know, decreasing that value of, of a plane seat by adding on these other fees or limiting what they're doing. Same thing with, with your cable companies and various different things. It's this element of not treating that customer with making it easy and, and delighting, not even delighting them, right? But doing Just treating them with respect, uh, you know, that yeah. uh, treating them like a, uh, you know, like you would like to be treated. Uh, uh, and, you know, for me, it was uh, that uh, satellite radio provider, it ended up just being pure friction. I'd, I'd look, at, uh, look at how much time and effort I would have to spend to maintain the price, which I would have been willing to pay the price had they just said, you know, okay, this is the price you're going to have forever. Don't have to think about it. That yeah. would have been okay. But saying, okay, I've got to go through this process every six months uh, was just too much. Yeah. So, Roger, I want to just go at the very beginning. We, we've, we've talked a lot about customer experience and, and friction, but you had talked about there's this element within companies about, uh, you know, the, the friction that organizations have internally with their employees and various different things. Can you give us some examples of what some of those internal organizational frictions are and where you see some of the biggest issues or, or what you've learned from from the research that you've done? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, I think that uh, companies have a big problem, or at least most companies do, because according to Gallup, uh, 85% of uh, all employees in the U.S. are either not engaged with their employer or are uh, actively disengaged. Uh, and that's uh, actively disengaged means that they're really uh, unhappy. Uh, but, the, you know, the vast majority just nah, don't really uh, care. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that. But uh, if we look at how people are spending their time and how much of that time is apparently wasted, uh, one study showed that uh, half of all meetings are probably a waste of time. Uh, you know, almost 70 percent of workers say they're distracted by emails, meetings, messaging and so on. Uh, and uh, there's all this sort of uh, system imposed uh, effort and time that, uh, you know, rules and procedures that aren't really important, but uh, have to be followed, uh, or even the perception that something has to be done a certain way when it's not really uh, a mandate. Uh, there's so much waste of time when people are doing things that they perceive are not either helping the customer, uh, helping themselves, or even helping the objectives of their employer. Uh, that's when they become disengaged. They just feel that like nobody's paying attention. Uh, I'm filling out these uh, forms every um, week and, uh, you know, it's not serving a purpose, a waste of my time, waste of everybody's time, but hey, they're paying me to do it, so I'll do it. Uh, yep. uh, you know, that is um, when people can uh, see that their efforts are paying off, when they're doing something, they can see that they're helping a customer, that they're learning a new skill, or even that, you know, they're helping the, their employer uh, be more profitable in a, in a uh, in a productive way because they did something positive, then, uh, you know, that's very rewarding and they will be engaged. That you, re It reminds me of um, the progress pr principle by Teresa Amable, right, where she talks about that engagement level and they did that really cool research where they had journal entries and various different things. But it was about, hey, if I'm moving forward, even if it's just a little bit every day, I'm feeling engaged and motivated around that. And the things where I start to feel really disengaged is where I feel like I've, I've run into this roadblock or, so, or we, we move back. And it sounds like the, you know, some of these friction components really lend themselves into that feeling of being stalled or even potentially like you, you, we have to put a form in to get, you know, resources for this, but I didn't fill something out. So now it gets kicked back to me and now I have to redo it again. So uh, it, it seems like there's a lot of that, that we could probably really look at from an organizational perspective to say, are we, why are we doing this and what is the real reason behind it? Yeah. You know, a lot of it has to do with trust. I think uh, uh, Paul Zak, the oxytocin guy, uh, wrote a great book called The Trust Factor, where uh, he not only surveyed people inside uh, high performing businesses and lower performing businesses, but also took uh, thousands or tens of thousands of blood samples to measure oxytocin levels. And oh. what he found was that uh, uh, high trust organizations outperform those with low trust. Uh, and if you look at some of the things that uh, uh, companies require, uh, it's because they don't trust their employees. Uh, uh, I've been an entrepreneur for, I don't know, 30 plus years, but uh, uh, I had a brief uh, corporate stint uh, for a while. And uh, when a uh, business uh, company acquired my company, uh, and uh, they had a rule that every receipt uh, had to be attached to an expense report, okay? So even if you bought a, a $2 coffee at the airport uh, when you're on a business trip, uh, 
if you wanted to be reimbursed for that, you had to attach a piece of paper. Uh, yeah. Now, that is way outside uh, the guidelines of the IRS. Uh, they would be... Uh, uh, you know, happy if I just said, okay, this is what uh, that expense was. Uh, but there was, I think, a lack of trust that some employees at least would probably be dishonest and um, put stuff down that they didn't actually spend. Uh, now, I don't think the company ever evaluated what the cost of that would be, how many employees would uh, use that in some fraudulent way. But this this was a requirement for every single employee uh, uh, from the lowest level uh, entry level salesperson uh, to I was a VP level. And, you know, we all had to do the same thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, not only did this take a lot of work on my part, because I had to collect all these things, half the time I'd lose them. But uh, I uh, and then I'd submit a report and I have this big wad of paper stapled to it. Uh, somebody in accounting had to go through and check all those. And I found they actually did check all them because one time I did lose one somehow between the uh, reporting, uh, writing it on the form and stapling it. Uh, and somebody spotted that uh, missing uh, two or three dollar receipt oh and said and kicked kick back the report said, "Hey, yo, uh, you missed this." So people were actually checking that stuff, which answered one question that I had. I assumed that maybe they just sort of <laughs> took it for granted that you were being honest since you had those papers there. Uh, and then finally, they decided to uh, streamline the process uh, by instead of stapling paper, you could scan or photograph your receipt and then attach that in either like a JPEG or PDF format uh, to an electronically submitted expense report. Uh, which was interesting because it actually did reduce the friction for the accounting people. They could now uh, see all this <laughs> stuff, uh, uh, you know, in uh, in electronic format. But now, instead of just ramming a staple through a pile of paper, uh, you know, I'm firing up the scanner or the uh, mobile phone and taking pictures of stuff. So, you know, it's, uh, they their solution for um, making the process easier uh, uh, ended up simply transferring more work uh, to the employee. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where if anybody looked at it, said, well, what if we just said, you know, uh, anything above twenty dollars that needs a receipt? You know, you could probably eliminate ninety percent of that paper. But uh, you know, in the IRS guidelines, are even much higher than that. Uh, you know, but nobody really looked at this. They just felt, okay, this is going to help us uh, hold down our expenses because. Uh, in some cases, people just aren't going to bother submitting it. You know, if you've got a, a you know, a five dollar expense, uh, you know, you may just not even worry about the receipt. Well, and you have to wonder, I mean, just from a business case, it is the cost of the added time it took you as well as accounting to go through it, how much that soft, I mean, granted, that's a soft cost, but there's a cost associated oh, yeah. with that versus the actual amount of fraud that could potentially happen. And there's a there's an ROI there that you have to wonder, if you really thought about it, you know, from an organizational perspective, I'll I'll take a little bit of fraud because in the in the end we're we're actually being we could more save a lot. yeah we could save a lot. Well, there's a, there's a story in uh, the book about a guy named Irv Refkin who had a uh, a business. He was a Navy contractor uh, that did uh, repair work for the Navy, and um, uh, he had an uh, operations manager come in and saw that uh, uh, they weren't really that well organized. Uh, people just uh, kept tools by their workplace. So they said, you know, people are going to steal tools. Uh, we should have a tool crib where in the morning people check out their tools and in the uh, uh, evening when they're ready to go home, they check them back in. And so uh, this, you know, seemed like a, a best management practice perhaps and went along with it. But then one morning he's uh, walking around the plant and sees this big line of people at the tool crib and said, what are those people doing while well, they're waiting to get their tools? Tools. And so uh, he ended up uh, firing the uh, operations uh, manager, uh, getting rid of the tool crib completely, letting people keep the tools by their workstation. Uh, they had negligible tool theft, tool theft happening, but they gained a whole lot of productivity. Uh, and not only that, to me, the important thing is uh, going back to Paul Zach work, uh, they increase the trust level. You know, when you make people do stuff, uh, say, okay, you're to get this, you're going to have to go to this place and fill out a form and have somebody approve it. Uh, you know, you were saying, I don't trust you to do the right thing yourself. So uh, when you build that trust, uh, you create much greater engagement too. Not, not to mention just eliminating a lot of wasted time. 
Yeah, it reminds me of the uh, the Dave Packard story from uh, Hewlett, uh, Hewlett Packard uh, when uh, employees were able to go to a place to get old computer parts and kind of build their own things and 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 make stuff uh, out of old parts. And it was just an open warehouse. And then one day Dave Packard went down and saw that it was locked. He was there late at night, and so <laughs> Dave called a you know a locksmith or something, had the or a bolt cutter, had it had the 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 thing cut open and uh, left it open and let just left a note saying, you know, don't ever lock this again. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, uh, especially if it's like a parts graveyard, where are the losses going to be? You know, it's, uh, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, most people, um, if you trust them, uh, they trust you and they won't abuse the privileges you offer them. Trust is reciprocal. You gain trust by trusting somebody else. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, We'd like to talk a little bit about music here, Roger. This is not uh, to throw you off or anything, but but with all this reducing friction in the world of of uh, music, uh, you actually you know in the book you actually talk about you know how the music ind- industry responded to Napster by you know not in, not in, uh, reducing friction by actually making it more difficult, but. Um, but in the world of Spotify and Alexa and all these simpler ways, I'm curious about your musical listening. So has has your experience of listening to music changed with the, with a reduction in friction uh, with the availability of um, you, you know being able to just say, "Hey, Alexa, play you know my French cooking music." playlist. <laughs> well, know? well, sure. I think, uh, you know, I can't imagine, I can't remember when I uh, bought a CD uh, uh, and uh, I'm not a really heavy music listener. For some reason, I uh, listen to a lot of text, whether I'm at the gym or in the car, uh, by and large, I'm listening to news or podcasts or something like that. But uh, I do listen uh, to music. And of course, uh, I stream it from either Pandora or Amazon Prime or maybe Spotify. Uh, because it's really easy. And, you know, yeah. I, you mentioned the music industry's reaction. It's not unique to them. Often when entrenched industries are presented with a better way uh, to accomplish something, something that is easier for the customer and better for the customer, uh, their first reaction isn't to adopt it. It's to kill it. Uh, so, yeah. you know, when uh, uh, taxi services were confronted with Uber, that was a remarkably better experience for the rider uh, yeah. than traditional taxis. I mean, there's no aspect of riding or uh, transportation that they did not improve over a traditional taxi experience. Uh, instead of saying, wow, we can adopt this and do a better job, we've already got a lot of the infrastructure we need. We've got uh, you know drivers on salary. This is great. This is awesome. Uh, instead, they go to the government and say, hey, you guys got to make this illegal. Uh, right. And, you know, un- unfortunately, that is typical of too many industries, particularly those where uh, they have been kind of entrenched and sleepy for a while. Yeah, I think that's a great component as you think about how many times organizations or industries in general get fearful. And so instead of looking at this as an opportunity to improve their own way of doing business, again, going back to, you know, some of the earlier conversations of, of, you know, airlines and other places and what they could do to make it better. But instead they just hunker down and say, let's, let's make sure that we keep what we have and and don't let anybody else take any part of that, not expand the pie and expand the service ability, but really just, you know, go from a fear mindset as opposed to an opportunity mindset. Uh, you know, Roger, I'm wondering if there are, uh, you've been working on friction for a long time. You've, you've invested a lot of your time and energy into really understanding it. Are there a couple of tips that you could boil down to share with listeners to say, you know, these two or three things would be ways that you could reduce friction either with, internally within your organization or as marketers kind of focusing on customers that you think are really important, possibly overlooked uh, or not paid attention to enough? Yeah, I think the first uh, one would be more on the customer side, and that is uh, that it's so important to observe your customers, uh, actual real customers, uh, not what you think customers are or who they are or what you, what you think they should be, uh, but to you know observe uh, real customers doing what you want them to do, whether it is uh, uh, placing an order on your website, using your mobile app, 
Uh, and, you know, there's different ways of doing this. You can actually uh, observe people like in a lab setting. Uh, you can use uh, digital tools to see uh, right. what they're doing, what, what they're clicking on, what, how long they spend in a certain activity and so on. Where do they bail out of a process? But, uh, you know, I don't know about you folks, but I have had innumerable experiences where I'm trying to get something done on a website or in an app, and I simply cannot figure out what I'm supposed to do next. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, uh, and I, I'm not uh, completely unsavvy. Uh, you know, I figure that I can sort out most interfaces pretty well, but every now and then I get something that just stumps me, and I, and I have to stand back and wonder, did anybody in this organization ever watch users trying to do this thing? Because uh, if I'm stuck, uh, I have to believe that, you know, some significant portion of other users are stuck as well. Uh, and as a result, uh, they're losing sales, losing leads, you know, whatever they're trying to do. And um, so there are many ways to observe that behavior. And I would, I would really recommend using as many as possible. You know, do uh, uh, observation of users, maybe do some... Uh, sort of uh, user testing type things where uh, it's done remotely, maybe even some emotion measurement things where you see what people, um, what emotions people are expressing, say using facial coding or some other metric uh, to see, oh, you know, when people get to this point, suddenly uh, many of them show this sign of frustration. Okay, well, then maybe there's something to look at there. And then also digital tools, because often, um, you know, especially if you are a uh, really big organization like a Walmart or somebody, you know, you, you've got so many moving pieces in your website. You've got millions of products and, you know, departments and everything else uh, that uh, you need those digital metrics to show where uh, you have anomalies, where are people bailing out unexpectedly. Where are people spending more time than you anticipate? So, I mean, to me, that's that's number one. Internally in organizations, I think that if you focus first on the customer experience, uh, uh, your people will start pointing out friction that they see uh, inside their organization. Because even as they're making things smoother for their customer, uh, people start seeing friction. It's... Uh, 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 an interesting experience, but I've seen it happen uh, when I've given a speech at a conference where uh, uh, in the time after the speech, you know, you're standing in line at the buffet and they uh, uh, ran out of forks or the main course or something, and you got these people standing around waiting and uh, someone's saying, ah, friction, friction. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, once they start thinking about it, they start seeing it. And the more you see uh, in one context, you start seeing it in other contexts. So uh, to me, the, the real win for a company is to uh, focus first on uh, getting the friction out of the customer experience, but also uh, uh, enable people to address internal friction, provide uh, a venue, empower people to uh, both uh, identify and report uh, issues, uh, or even hopefully fix them. Uh, and that may take a little bit of management buy-in because, you know, often uh, some uh, manager three levels removed put a procedure in place uh, and you know, has no clue as to what the impact is uh, on the people who are actually doing it. But at the same time, that person is going to be resistant to change and say, well, hey, they, they just need to do their job and not uh, uh, complain about how difficult it is. You know, as, as opposed to saying, uh, you know, I think one of, the, one of the most powerful questions a leader can ask in an organization, and this could be asked to anybody, even a frontline person, uh, is how can I make your job easier? You know, and that's right. a, that's a question that most leaders don't ask. Uh, it seems like a lot of managers are focused on uh, how can I get you to work more. Uh, you know, <laughs> how can I get you uh, to increase your output? Uh, but asking that question uh, does a couple of things. First of all, it identifies things that are wasting time, uh, and secondly, it uh, uh, shows the individual that uh, the organization cares will listen, uh, and especially if maybe. Uh, an employee has been around for years, but nobody has ever asked that question before. That can be very powerful. Yeah, yeah. builds up some of that trust component you talked yes, about. Yes, exactly. Earlier. Well, and and you're talking about really creating a friction aware corporation, right? A, a, a corporate environment that is that is aware and sensitive to friction, and then has the uh, you know the intellectual honesty to to be able to speak about it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I do think that once you see it on the customer side, it becomes more apparent internally. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Roger, thank you. We have enjoyed this conversation, some really great insights. So we want to have a big thank you for you. And uh, and I know our listeners will enjoy it as well. Yeah, very much so. Thanks so much, Roger. Well, uh, Tim and Kurt, thanks for inviting me. And, you know, uh, we fixed the airlines on this show. And we'll have to uh, come back at some point in the future and maybe pick another industry to fix. 
we'll oh, t- I don't know. Communications we can... cable, you know, any, any yeah. of those uh, ones. We'll just go up the list. We're, we're Great. It's, it's been a lot of fun. All righty. Thanks so much. See you. Welcome to our grooming session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavioral groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our frictionless brains. I hope it's frictionless. I think I have a ton of friction in my brain, actually. I should have said... <laughs> Today you do. Frictionful? Sh- frictionful, frictioned brain? I don't know. Frictionable? I, frictionable? Is that a word? F- Friction-tosis? <laughs> 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 right. uh, fr- frictionosis? I don't know. Fr- oh my God, you are going down <laughs> yeah. a rabbit hole uh, yeah, sorry. that just should not go down. Okay, what are we going to groove on? Uh, with, let's let's Roger? let's groove on the component when he was talking about the comparison of best practices. Right? But why mm. aren't people building? You know, a company is doing this great element that's reducing friction, but other companies aren't necessarily copying that. So why aren't we yeah. doing that? What else? Uh, let's also talk about uh, gifts to loyal customers. Why aren't more companies just expressing gratitude to their, their loyal customers? All right. And the last thing we're going to groove on? Adding friction to deter behavior. All right. Because that just pisses the daylights out of me. <laughs> so. When it's done inappropriately. When it's done inappropriately, that's right. All right. That's right. I probably don't notice when it's done appropriately. Well, we, you can add friction in appropriate times, right? I, I want to add friction, which is why I asked you to move those nuts away from me and over to the other side of the table. So now if I want to grab a handful of nuts, I'm going to have to get up, walk around you, grab some nuts, and come back here. That was purposely adding, adding friction. friction. Well done. Well so done. I will not be just mindlessly chewing on nuts while we're doing this recording. Don't change the man, change the environment. Exactly. There it is. That is what we're doing. Thank uh, you, Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are we going to start Okay. With? So uh, should we start with uh, this best practices thing? Sure. Yeah, so this is tricky, right? Uh, we have this, my observation is that we have uh, the ability that's very strong to compare one thing from one company with a similar thing from another company. And we say, the company that's doing it better is the best practice. So why doesn't this other company that I typically do business with doing it the same way? Right. Why aren't they adopting the best practice? Well, and why aren't they? Well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, you're asking the question I come am. up with the answer well at least in some cases in a technological environment there might be patents involved there, there could be patent protection to, to prevent other companies from doing it exactly the same way okay so we talked about in the interview with roger we talked about amazon's one click and you yes. brought up something because i brought that whole thing like why aren't other companies doing it and yeah, you, you said you just think that every Damn company should have one click. And what? And, and you said that there's a patent on that. Uh, Amazon had patent protection on that for for many years. Yeah, which blew me away. No wonder they became the the behemoth of who whatever they are because they can't. They could. They had the intellectual capital behind it. They had that intellectual capital. So I did not know that. So now my you know madness at Target or whoever else was out there going oh. All right. Well, now I'm not so mad at you. I understand that you didn't do it because you were just lazy and stupid. It was because there was actually law out there protecting Amazon and their monopoly on the one click. Right. Right. It's you're you're not, you're not saying that they were lazy and stupid and unable to do it. You're just saying that <laughs> they weren't able to do it. They weren't <laughs> able to do okay. it. Okay. Well, we don't know the other two, but we def- definitely know the, the last one. We still have this tendency to ask the, to draw these comparisons between you know any online shopping that I'm doing for merchandise. I'm thinking about Amazon's smooth experience, whereas uh, then any then I'm comparing that to any other company that I'm buying something from. Right. Okay. Any any company that I'm buying some kind of merchandise from, I'm going to make this comparison. Like, why don't they have it set up like Amazon? Because Amazon, in my mind, is the best practice. So, but if, it, it might be different if I was buying uh, online training. Okay. I wouldn't necessarily think about one click. 
So is this a, a component of joint comparison versus separate comparison? Kind of. It sounds like that, doesn't Even it? Even though it's not necessarily... We're not lining the, them up side by side. Lining them up side by side, necessarily doing it one after the other components aspect. But in people's minds, you're looking, you're a retail online entity. You, therefore, are being compared jointly against the best practice, in this case, Amazon. Within category. because Within I, category. Yeah, I don't think that it would apply if I was buying an automobile online mm. or if I was buying a house online or I don't know what else. Something so, really different. so in other words, if we're thinking about this, there's there's probably some insight for people if, if you're in, let's go, real estate. If you're in a real estate business, you need to be just as good or better than the best, the other real estate um components that are out there. Right. Not necessarily the same as an Amazon or the best in the entire, you know, online industry class, right? Unless Amazon gets into selling real estate and then they could become part of the comparison structure. But don't you think that even uh, across different, you know, industries and topics that there is this element of saying, "Hey, it is super easy to do business here." I might be buying a house. Shouldn't it be easier? Isn't that bar being raised uh, across industries, across fields, as opposed to just inside of one field? I mean, in some ways, I don't. Do you do you see this? Do you see that happening? Well, I just I, I think there is. I think there's that component where you're going. It's so easy to you know Apple thinking about just their first iPod and the variety of, you know, all of those components there. And that led itself to being, all right, well, anytime I have an electronic device, and maybe that is within field, but why isn't as intuitive and as easy as the iPod was, you know, those first times, right? Okay. So uh, I don't know. I think that's an interesting piece. But if you were to, if, if it was only within category, then, you know, from a business perspective, you only have to worry about being best in class in your industry or in your category. Right. So as a user experience, there's some pretty cool electronics on my new washer and dryer. Okay. It's pretty cool stuff, but it is by no means as easy to use or intuitive as uh, uh, my iPhone. Okay. Not at all. It's, it, it's worlds away. And I've never thought about comparing them. And yet that technology is for lack of a better word, available mm-hmm. to to the designers and the producers of the of the uh, durable goods of, of the washer and dryer. But shouldn't the the designers of the durable washer and dryer, right? Shouldn't they be striving to yes. be as easy yes. as your Apple product, your Apple iPhone? Why not? Why not? Is, is my damn question. Why not? <laughs> All right. I want to go on a crusade on this. All right. All right. We we beat that to death. What's next? No, I, I could beat it. I could beat that way more dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, gifts. Okay. So gifts. So, gosh, Roger brought up a great question. Why aren't more companies showing their loyal customers some kind of um, acknowledgement with with gifts or? Or, or reduction, so as opposed to benefits, as opposed to the uh, satellite radio provider increasing his pay, uh, you know, <laughs> right. how much he pays every year, and then having him have to go in to get it reduced. Mm-hmm. Going, wow, you have been a loyal customer for five years. We're granting you this ninety nine dollar rate for eternity. Mobile phone. Uh, uh, suppliers, carriers right. have been at the top of my list on this for a long time because there's all there's always changing new rates. They're always bringing in new programs, and never as a as a loyal customer. I was with one company for almost 15 years. Never did I get the the new rate that was better than what I was paying. I was locked into a contract, and so I didn't. I what I I couldn't apply. I couldn't. I couldn't be available. That or that that deal wasn't available to me because I was already locked into a two-year contract. It's like, I've been with you for 15 years. <laughs> you know, can't we, can't we dispense with the two-year contracts? Well, and you talked about this before we started uh, recording about, you know, a lot of smaller mom-and-pop shops seem to 
kind of do this intuitively. So it's right. kind of an accidental behavioral science component. The restaurant that uh, my wife and I go to on a regular basis, uh, they see us there. We kind of get to know them or we know each other's names. There's high fives when we come in. And then occasionally we'll, they'll just, the waiter will bring out an appetizer and say, here, this is on us. Thanks. Right. You know, thanks for being loyal customers. That's a cool surprise and delight experience. Right. Versus the the place that you used to go, the restaurant that I ate at forty times in a, every year, right? At least almost once a week, and never once was there even an acknowledgement of my of me by name, much less uh, here's an appetizer for free or thanks for your business. Well, and that was a place. So it's it's next to our old former employer BIW, right? And so it was a place that was frequented by many of them. Uh, and lots we of employees went there. Lots of people from, I mean, without BI being there, they may not be in business, right? I, I mean, there yeah. could be very much that. And we talked about, wouldn't it be, wouldn't have it been great if they would have acknowledged that connection? So, hey, let's offer a loyalty program that is for BI employees only. So you get a 10 punch card, different things. The idiosyncratic fit that oh, would yeah. have happened for yeah. that would have been amazing. Now I'm feeling highly motivated because I know that I am getting this special incentive and it's only to me and these other, you know, my tribe and everybody else is excluded from this, which is that idiosyncratic fit component yeah. and making that so you would have gone 50 times a year instead of 40 possibly. Hell yes. And that would have cost them one. So one for 10, you know, but we don't, as a business, we, we look at the cost side of things and we don't necessarily recognize the power that that recognition component, particularly on the consumer side, I think does. Like Roger was talking, loyalty programs uh, in the airline industry are more of a handcuff than they are a real gift. I mean, granted, yes, you get some perks, but those perks, I mean, <laughs> yeah. when we They're look at it, I mean, difficult to use. Well, and it, you know, it used to be upgraded to first class a lot, right? I'm gold on Delta. I think I've gotten what? upgraded to first class once in, in 30, you know, f- recent flights oh, where, yeah, where in great. the past it used to be a lot. Now I get, instead of being the, the tenth, you know, group to board. <laughs> I am the fourth group to board, and they've just changed that. By the way, they they put Comfort Plus in front of their their reward members, and so therefore, which basically says, if you pay more for your seat, you will be treated better than someone who has been flying with us for all these years, for all these years on a regular basis, yeah. for all these years. Yeah, yeah. and so. Which is, has a, a loss component to it, right? I'm like going, does it really matter to me? No, but it feels like a loss, so it feels really bad because now yeah. I'm not the. It's not military and disabled, you know, people who need extra time and and you know families with kids and then first class and then us. No, 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 no. Now it's there's now a you, whole another there's you know, an, another class of people that are monetarily jumping ahead of you. Right. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I think more companies could do with adding those types of positive recognition, gifts, givebacks, and the loyalty that that would engender would well outweigh the cost of those gifts. I don't have empirical evidence to prove it. Well, this is part of the problem is it's hard to come up with that data. Okay. It's not easy to come up with that data. That said... That's part of doing business today. You got to be business owners need to be looking at that stuff. You can't just say, "Well, that's hard," <laughs> and not do it. That doesn't work. Oh man, that's what I was. That's what I do. That's too <laughs> it's, hard. It's, I don't want to do that. I'm just gonna do what I always done. So, Kurt, one of the things that we failed to mention in the grooving session was some research. We failed. I f- okay. I failed. <laughs> I just wanting to just understand if it was we or if it was you. <laughs> I'll I'll own that. <laughs> you were the one who had researched it, brought it up, all of these things. I, all right. So uh, anyway, it was actually some really interesting research on on gifts and and different things, and it was by one of our favorite researchers, George Lowenstein. So yeah. what was it? So uh, George was hired by a P- Pittsburgh bank to try to understand 
ostensibly, if they wanted to get their high balance customers to keep their balances in the bank, to not withdraw them, what could they do? And the natural inclination was to say, well, we should send them gifts. They're loyal customers. Right. So let's send them gifts. And, um, but George wanted to test sequencing of what order of gifts would make a difference. Would thank you notes and gifts and in different orders and different values have an impact? And there's great, and I'll put it in the show notes. So you can go and check it out for that purpose. However, the underlying message is that gifts made a difference, a positive difference. So in comparison to the control, which was no gifts, every single gift sequence was a positive influence on retaining those bank balances inside of the bank. Exactly, exactly. So the, that gives more reason for customers, for clients, for companies to actually make an investment in sending gifts to their most loyal customers, to s- express some gratitude, express a thank you, do a surprise and delight, do something that is out of the ordinary, that is unexpected, and engage those customers uh, more deeply. It grabs an emotional component, I think, is probably the underlying you know, psychology behind why that works. Yes, so. yeah, and they tested more hedonic versus more utilitarian style gifts, and, and again, in different values across a variety of time, time frames as well. But, Very but, cool. But want to uh, urge everybody to check that out. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Okay, well, let's talk about adding friction. Adding friction. What do, you, what do you think about adding friction? Is that a great idea? In certain <laughs> instances, it is. Like moving the nuts further away. Moving from- the nuts. We've talked about my Oreos in the basement, right? There's That's the right. added friction. So to help you stop doing things, added friction is a wonderful component. Where it goes south, where it becomes sludge, is when you're adding, when an organization purposely adds in friction to keep you in something when you want to get out of it. Yeah. For instance, you know, trying to quit the wine club or to, you know, the, the not rec- be... The record of the month club. The record of, of the month club. Yeah, those subs- kind of things. Any, any kinds of subscriptions like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife recently stopped Facebook and she said that she didn't really stop Facebook she went on and went through all the procedures that she had to go through to end her relationship with Facebook. But in the end, they said, well, you're just on a 30-day hold and and we'll reinstate you unless we hear from you. It's like, whoa, <laughs> I'm telling you now, I'm done, baby. Yeah. And I don't need a cooling off period. <laughs> right, right. I don't need that. It's, it's interesting when you think about that, right? You think about the handcuffs that companies are trying to tie us to. And and as I mentioned, the long-term impact of that actually has larger ramifications than that immediate component. I will not try 30-day free trials or 14-day free trials with a company that could very well be super easy not to automatically enroll me and do different things. But because I've had bad experiences with other companies, I'm, I'm now shy of that. I'm, I'm weary. I'm fearful. So that keeps you from doing business with companies that say, you got 30 days free, just give us your credit card now. Right. That sucks. Yeah. And yet, I also get the company's perspective that they don't want to just continue rolling out lots of 30-day free trials uh, to over and over. And yet, that's kind of what they're saying. That's part of their business model. Well, if, if you're rolling out a 30-day or 14-day free trial, you're, the intent is that you love that product so much that you realize that it has a value for you. And here's the tricky part of that, right? Because now you have anchored in that the value for this is free, right? It's part so of it, yes. you, you So have, you have come into this, this relationship on this free component. It's very hard to go from free to paying for something. Hey, you gave that to me for free. Why would I ever pay for it? So the value has to be so dramatic, I think, in most of those instances that you're willing to, that the company should really realize that. If you think it's just nominal, don't do a free offer to get people in because you're you're basically anchoring them in at a point that is going to be hard. Then you're going to have to overcome some friction in in them trying to actually you know go and buy your 
your product. The firms are also basically saying, we really can't get someone to sign up at $15 a month or $40 a month or $100 a month, whatever it is, to start with. So we have to lure them in and then just hope that they, they forget right. and just keep, keep you know, subscribing month over month. And that's a pretty crappy business model. That is a pretty crappy. That's sludge. That's very much sludge. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Oh yeah. So uh, you know, I do. I do. I want to ask you. Uh, Roger was talking about how uh, he just he's adopting the simplest, most frictionless experience musically. He said, "I haven't bought a CD, and I can't remember how long. When was the last time you bought a CD?" I'm thinking. Long I'm pause. Thinking. We should have the Jeopardy music playing. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, it, it's been a year or two. I think we've done. I, I think I've bought. Actually, I know I've bought a CD from going to a music concert, and and the people are offering the CD there. Where when you're at the venue, I'm at the venue, the live, yeah. and I bought and I bought it there. Mm-hmm. Uh, going into a music. St- I take that back. I bought some for my my kids because they're very much into Imagine Dragons, and so I went oh. and got some CDs. That was probably a year and a half ago, but still, a that year was and a half, year and a half ago. Year and a half ago. Wow. Okay. So there okay. you go. All right. And you? Um, well, I'm in the unique position where I hang around with a lot of artists, and so I'm trading CDs most of the time. Uh-huh. In fact, virtually all the time. Okay. So I, you know, I'll give an artist uh, my CD, and they give me theirs, and so I get to hear a lot of new music that way. Okay. I, but I haven't paid for a CD in months. Months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been at least months. All right. So let's wrap up and let's kind of recap. Uh, this was a. Uh, advice from one of our listeners, Dr. Fred Bomber. Yes, Dr. Who Fred. recommended that we do a recap, and Tim's just folding through his papers to get there. I am. It's, there's a lot of papers to fold through. Unfolding, <laughs> folding, and unfolding, then more folding, and then more unfolding. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bomber, and here we go. Okay, so the first thing is that we want to make sure that we observe customers, that we, we take care and then we, we carefully watch what they're doing so that we can understand where the friction points are. Right. right. That, was, that was one of Roger's yes. Uh, tips. Yes. His other tip then was that once we get uh, in people starting to apply these or finding friction inside of their customers and the customer experiences that they have, that they'll start seeing that inside of the employee component. Yeah. And then, and then lastly, let's make sure that we all know that friction... The definition of friction, and I think Roger's got this great definition, is about the unnecessary expenditure of effort. Of time and effort. Time and effort. And so... And the proxies for effort. And guess what? Unnecessary is a very subjective term, but that's where the customer experience comes in. Right. And so again, just to recap, we talked about the what the friction was, what we just explained. We went in and talked about how different companies are... Um, having friction or not friction and that most likely if you're a company and you want somebody to do something, you want to reduce the friction. And when you increase friction, don't do it in a sludgy way. Definitely. Sludgy, sludgy way. Avoid sludge. Be ethical. Right. Avoid sludge. And with that, listeners, thanks for hanging in with us for another episode. And please leave a comment or a review and we would very much appreciate that. And if you have any suggestions like Dr. Bomber had, Send them our way. 